Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this All Saints Sunday. Welcome to all who are here in the building and those joining us online. It's good to be together as the body of Christ. As we gather, we acknowledge that for thousands of years, this land has been the traditional home of the Attawandaran, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples. This territory is still home to indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to live, work, and worship here. James, do you want to help me light candles for this part? I could use a helper. Here, Here you hang on to this. And I'll tell you when it's the right time. See, we've got three little candles in there, and we're going to light one at a time when I let you know. I'll give you a hand with that, okay? We gather at the font, members of the body of Christ, united through baptism with the communion of all the saints. Together, we remember and pray for all the saints of the church, those still living and those who have died. We light a candle for our loved ones who've died in the past year. For we know that just as one is united with Christ in a death like his, certainly one shall be united with Christ in a resurrection like his. All right, so we're going to hold on to the wooden part. Hold, no, hold down there. We're going to light this. Can you light one of the candles? We light a candle for our loved ones who've died in years past. We give you thanks for their lives and for the love that lives on in us. May their memory forever be a blessing. You can light, take that flame and share it with the next candle. We light a candle for all who are gathered here in this place, a reminder of our own sainthood and a prayer that God's love would emanate from within each one of us. I light the last one. And you can pull this down. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for the lives of all your saints. May your light shine through us, a witness to the sainthood to which we all belong. Amen. James, I'm wondering if you can help me out with my theme time. I need a helper again for this part. I'll be coming back here, Lori, so you don't need to move them. All right, I need you to hang on to that, because I know that you know how to use that. I'm going to need the flashlight in a second. And we're going to come back down here. Do you know what this is that I have in my hand? A blue jay. A blue jay? Is it blue? Do you know what the red ones are called? It's not a robin. What do we call the red ones? That's a cardinal. Have you seen a cardinal before? Yeah. And do you know what this is made out of? Glass. It's glass. This is stained glass. And the thing with stained glass, if we're going to hang it, oh, you already know. Right? We don't hang it in a, on the wall. right? I mean, we could. It's still very beautiful. But to see the full beauty of something that's made out of glass, we want to hang it in a window. So I thought. You got my flashlight going already. Come over here. We got a white background. Okay, you gotta come. Oh, maybe my light's gonna help me already. I might not need the flashlight. Come over this way. You got the flashlight on. Turn it this way. <laughs> can you guys, how do we make it bigger? But look at that. We can see the beautiful, and yes, you can see the red. It's not a solid red, right? It's got some darker pigments in it. Isn't that beautiful? 
Perfect. Thank you very much. Can you please turn the flashlight off for me now? You got it. That one always gets tricky for me. Thank you. All right. So today is All Saints Sunday. And one of the things that I always like to talk about is what is a saint? What is a saint? Do you have any answers to that question? I think often we think of especially holy people, especially good people. Um, in our Bible story this morning, we're going to hear about the prophet Elijah, and certainly someone like Elijah or Moses. We think of the disciples, um, Mary and Joseph, right? Jesus' parents. Jesus' uh, contemporaries, his friends, that those sorts of folks, right, that we remember as faithful people, that those are saints. I don't know if you ever, do you ever think of yourself as a saint? <laughs> one of my favorite definitions of a saint, and I think it's a true one, is that a saint is anyone who, uh, through whom God's light shines. All right, so in our story, we're going to hear about Elijah. But there's some other characters in that story that I think especially show that saintliness through, through their actions. Um, and maybe unexpected characters. So listen for that in the story. But of course, too, today in our worship, we're going to be lighting a bunch of candles. And we've got photographs on this side. And I know in your minds, you all have um, photographs of those, those saints, those loved ones, family members, friends, special people who you are remembering today. And we know that none of those folks, just as is true for us, none of them were perfect, right? We are all flawed human beings. But they are people who we loved and that, um, that loved us and that we loved back. And it's that love, um, that sharing of, of God's light, of God's love, that makes them saints that we're remembering today too. Right? They revealed something of God's love to us. So when we light candles too as part of that, as we lit some already and we're going to light some more too, that light is a, a symbol, a reminder of how their light continues to shine in our lives. And so we'll invite us to, to think about that piece today too, how the light of those people that you are remembering today, how that light continues to shine in your life. I'm going to set this down because I don't want to, <laughs> anything to happen to it. And I'll invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Lord God, in your great love, you bring all of us together into one family called the body of Christ. We thank you for all of the saints who have shown us how to love and care for each other. Let your light shine in our hearts today and every day. Amen. I invite you to rise in body and in spirit for our acclamation. Reading from 1 Kings chapter 17, may we be equipped by these words to walk in love for God, ourselves, our neighbors, all people, and all God's creation. Elijah from Tishbe, was one of, who was one of the settlers in Gilead, said to Ahab, as surely as the Lord lives, God's, Israel's God, the one I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain these years unless I say so. 
Then the Lord's word came to Elijah, go from here and turn east. Hide by the Cherith Brook that faces the Jordan River. You can drink from the brook. I have also ordered the ravens to provide for you there. Elijah went and did just what the Lord said. He stayed by the Cherith Brook that faced the Jordan River. The ravens brought bread and meat in the mornings and evenings. He drank from the Cherith Brook. After a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. The Lord's word came to Elijah. Get up, up and go to Zarephath in, near Sidon and stay there. I have ordered a widow there to take care of you. Elijah went, left and went to Zarephath. As he came to the town gate, he saw a widow collecting sticks. He called out to her, please get a little water for me in this cup so I can drink. She went to get some water. He then said to her, please get me a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any food, only a handful of flour in a jar and a bit of oil in a bottle. Look at me, I'm collecting two sticks so I can make some food for myself and my son. We'll eat the last of the food and then die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid, go and do what you said. Only make a little loaf of bread for me first, then bring it to me. You can make something for yourself and your son after that. This is what Israel's God, the Lord, says. The jar of flour won't decrease and the bottle of oil won't run out until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. The widow went and did what Elijah said. So the widow Elijah and the widow's household ate for many days. The jar of flour didn't decrease, nor did the bottle of oil run out, just as the Lord spoke through Elijah. God's story, our story. Thanks be to God. So as we continue to make our way through God's story, this week we encounter the prophet Elijah. And just to set us in our timeline, about 30 years, so only 30 years, not a lot of time has passed since King Solomon's death, right? We heard about his story last week about dedicating the temple. But even in that, uh, those three decades, so much change has swept the region. This united kingdom, the 12 tribes of Israel united into one kingdom that happened under Solomon's father's reign, under King David, already that is no more. After a century of unity, the kingdom has split into two. The northern part keeps the name Israel, and the southern part becomes the kingdom of Judah. And so Elijah, he is a prophet in that northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, around the year 850 BC, under the reign of a king named Ahab. As a royal prophet, Elijah's job is to make sure the king obeys God's commands. And Elijah has his hands full with King Ahab. King Ahab has uh, several non-Israelite wives who Um, are all introducing their religious practices. So these religious practices from other countries, uh, worshiping other gods, to the people of Israel. And Elijah takes particular issue with King Ahab's wife, Jezebel. And I'm sure that's a name, perhaps, that's familiar to to you. Um, Queen Jezebel was a Canaanite, And when she came uh, and married King Ahab, she brought with her the worship of the god Baal, right? And there's a whole other story in Elijah's uh, narrative about a showdown with the priests of Baal, right? Trying to light these two altars on fire. As a punishment for this, we're told that God brings a three-year-long drought on the region because of all of this foreign worship that is happening. 
And it's in the midst of this devastating drought that God calls Elijah to just pick up and leave home. And even though this puts him in a very precarious position, Elijah faithfully goes where God sends him. But what a difficult and a scary time for Elijah, right? Separated from his community, from all that's, that's familiar, needing to find sustenance in unfamiliar territory, in a time of drought, no less. Elijah really is at the mercy of the wilderness and of God. As a metaphor, Elijah's journey into the wilderness is not unlike the experience of grief. When someone we love dies, suddenly we find ourselves thrust on a journey that we never asked to go on, right? Forced to navigate wholly unfamiliar territory. Reflecting on what it was like after her mother died, journalist Chitra Ramaswamy writes this. I have learned that grief is a foreign country and we do things differently here. We become tourists in our old existences, constantly losing our minds and keys, twice in my case, trying to get by with next to no language. We're overwhelmed by the smallest of things, floored by an episode of Gardner's World, undone by a leaf falling from a tree. We're somewhere else, in another time, visited by things said and unsaid. All right, grief disorients us, it unmoors us. It's, it's a yearning, right? It's a place of yearning for, for home, to go back to a time, to a place that is no more. Right, a time where our loved one still, still is. It's that yearning to go back home. In the wilderness, God directs Elijah to the Sherith Brook. And it's in this wild place that God sends ravens to bring food for Elijah. And ravens were considered unclean animals according to Israelite laws. But in this new reality, where Elijah finds himself in this moment, none of that matters. Food is food when you're hungry, and Elijah eats what the ravens bring him, recognizing God's gift and grace in this wilderness time. Eventually, the brook runs dry, though, and Elijah has to move on. So God sends him to Zarephath and Sidon. Now, that's not a place that I think is familiar to most of us, but what's important to know about this location where he's being sent is not only this is, is this another foreign land, but it's the homeland of Queen Jezebel, right? So presumably filled with more worshippers of the god Baal. You know, all of what Elijah has been, been speaking out against, God is now sending him into the heart of that territory. But again, he's got nothing more to lose. Walking by faith, Elijah goes. And again, Elijah is cared for by someone unexpected. Thirsty and hungry, right, Elijah implores a poor widow to give him a drink and a meal. And she barely has enough to feed herself and her child. And so, of course, she protests at first. But Elijah promises that there will be enough. And so she brings him a meal. And in this foreshadowing of Jesus feeding the multitudes, we have this miracle, right? The story of Elijah and the widow's family being able to eat from this small store of meal and oil for many days. What strikes me as special about Elijah's story, especially as we think about it on All Saints Sunday, is that God doesn't provide sustenance for Elijah out of thin air, right? Instead, God uses ravens 
and a poor widow to make sure that Elijah's physical needs are met. Through these unexpected saints, right, through animals, through a vulnerable stranger, Elijah also finds relationship and connection. Days, like all saints, remind us of the gift and blessing of human relationships. We give thanks for the saints, not just for who they were, but for who they were to us. Right? Ordinary, beloved, blessed people whose love and kindness and faith and care saw us through good times and bad. Parents, grandparents, children, siblings, pastors, Sunday school teachers, mentors, friends, right? all sorts of folks whose uh, love has left an imprint on our hearts because they, they shared God's gift of love with us through their words and actions. And while it can raise painful emotions, right, difficult emotions to remember those who have died, our sadness is a sign. It's a gift uh, that reminds us what a mark those lives have left upon us. Uh, I love that quote where they say, grief is the price we pay for love. Right? And the more deeply we've loved, the more deeply we will grieve. But we're promised and we know that even in our grief, that love is still there. That love lives on in us and through us. For you who are grieving today, whether it's a loss that is a recent one or it's been a many, many years, like Elijah, may you find the courage to ask for help when you need it, knowing it's not a sign of weakness but a sign of our interconnectedness. I also pray that when and if you can't ask, because sometimes that's the hardest thing, and sometimes we don't even know what it is we need in our grief. I pray that sustenance and comfort will show up for you in surprising ways and beautiful surprises, and especially in the least likely pe people and places. And for all of us, may the memory of the saints those relationships of gift and grace and love encourage us to keep on looking out for one another, right? Because that is something that all of us can do and that is so, um, it's, a, it's a small thing for us to do, but it has such a huge impact when we do it, right? Checking in on friends and neighbors, especially when it's been weeks and months and even years after a loss. Right? Reminding them, and it's just a phone call, a checking in, right? It reminds them that they are not alone, and especially that their loved one is not forgotten, and that is such an incredible gift. For we honor the memory of the saints, when even in the wilderness, even when we're in unfamiliar territory, we carry on in Jesus' way. Right, that way of peace, of compassion, of checking in, of walking alongside. Because as we do that, the love of God is always shining through us to care for stranger and for friend. Amen. Our hymn of the day is number 418, Rejoice in God's Saints. I'll invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together.
O God, our help in ages past and our hope for years to come, we give you thanks for all your faithful people, the great cloud of witnesses who have followed the light of your word through the centuries and in our time and place. Today we remember all those dear to us who have died this past year. Delmar Abig, cousin of Hazel. Linda Anger, friend of Sandra Schantz. Bert Barker, cousin of Bar Barb Burden. Dave Bechtel. Avery Best, friend of Barbara Berg. Arthur Davidson, brother of Don and brother-in-law of Virginia. Don Davidson, husband of Virginia. Robert Davidson, brother of Don and brother-in-law of Virginia. Kyle Dawson. Roland Desjardins, nephew-in-law of Nile. Tony De Simone. Mark Elmy, friend of Jean Leffinen and Barb Jones. Jean Ferguson, wife of Patricia's cousin. Trudy Fitzpatrick, friend of Barbara Berg. Daphne Gagnon, friend of Suzanne Sauter. Reverend, Reverend Martin Giebel, colleague of Pastor Laura. Jack Griffin, brother-in-law of Jan Newton and Dan Legere. Wanda Hone, friend of Hazel and Niall. Reverend Bob Hutchison, colleague of Pastor Laura. Alan Lepinen, husband of Jean. Ronnie Lies, cousin-in-law of Linda Say. Joanne Sheldrake, friend of Barbara Berg. Janet Whitfield, friend of Monica Gomes, and Richard Yancey, nephew-in-law of Niall. As we remember these dear ones, we pray that you would heal any memories of hurt and failure. Give us wisdom and grace to use well the time that is left to us here on earth, to follow in the way of compassion and love that Christ has shown us, the way that leads to everlasting life. Strengthen us in our journey through this world until we too are carried into the harvest of eternal life where suffering and death will be no more. Amen.
receive this blessing. May the God of all creation in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service, give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, sovereign, savior, and spirit be with you today and always. Amen. <laughs>